73-year-old Gregor and 72-year-old Irma Palasics lived in Canberra, Australia in 1999. On the night of November 6, 1999, two masked men forced their way into the Palasics' Grover Crescent home at around 9.30 p.m. The couple were bound with cable ties and savagely beaten before the man ransacked their home, stealing cash and jewelry. Gregor managed to free himself and call police, but Irma suffocated on her own blood and lost her life at the scene. Detective Sergeant Craig Marriott recalled the event. They were violently assaulted. They were bound with cable ties, duct tape, and a telephone cord, and the house was ransacked. After a period of what is estimated to be about an hour, Mr. Palasics, who had been in and out of consciousness, was able to free himself from his bindings and found his wife face down in the hallway. He rolled her over and removed her bindings, but she had passed away. She had effectively drowned in her own blood from a broken nose. Detectives who started investigating the case found that the Palasics were also victims of aggravated burglaries in 1997 and 1998, which are thought to be linked to the third fatal break-in. Police made it known that they believed someone in Melbourne's Hungarian community could hold vital information on who was responsible for what happened to Irma Palasics. Investigators found DNA evidence at the crime scene, but with DNA technology not being as advanced in 1999, there was little they could do. In 2012, a $500,000 reward was offered for anyone able to help the police secure a successful conviction in the case. In 2019, investigators decided to take another look at the case. DNA technology was now a lot more advanced. Almost immediately, a DNA match was established through the National Crime Investigation DNA Database. DNA testing led investigators to Steve Fabrizi. It took a while to track Fabrizi down. When he was questioned by investigators on September 8, 2023, Fabrizi made partial admissions to his involvement in the incident. He admitted being in the premises for the purpose of the burglary. He also gave details of the burglary that was not known publicly. 68-year-old Steve Fabrizi from Roville, Melbourne, was then subsequently arrested and charged with taking the life of Irma Palasics. Fabrizi faced Dandenong Magistrates Court on September 21, 2023, where he applied for release on bail. In opposing bail, Detective Sergeant Craig Marriott told the court police he had serious concerns that Fabrizi, also known as Istvan Fabrizi, could flee the country if released, as he is a dual citizen of Hungary. Marriott said they also feared the 68-year-old may interfere with witnesses with his alleged co-offender still on the run. The court heard that while Fabrizi owns his own home in Australia, he has no family there. With police aware, he planned to return to Hungary, where he owns land upon his retirement. Fabrizi also has about $250,000 in savings, Marriott said, creating further concern that he had the means to leave Australia. I am also aware he has made statements to Victoria Police while in custody about wanting to harm himself. He made the same statement to us, he said. He asked us to shoot him. The court heard while the 68-year-old has had no prior offenses for failing to answer bail, he did spend time in prison from 2010 to 2012 after being convicted of conspiring to hijack a truckload of cigarettes. Magistrate Jason Ong ultimately refused bail and ordered Fabrizi to appear in Canberra Magistrate's Court on an undetermined date. In a statement released on behalf of the Palasics family, they said, 
After nearly 24 years of pain, questioning, and uncertainty, they had never given up hope of finding out who was responsible for this heinous act. Our grandparents did not deserve what happened to them. Not only was Irma taken from us, but Gregor's life all but ended on that night, and ours have never been the same, they said. Outside the court, Detective Superintendent Scott Mahler from the ACT Police said this arrest was immensely satisfying for investigators. The family of Irma Polasics never gave up hope, never ceased asking for community assistance, and always worked to keep the case in people's minds, he said. Mahler said police were continuing to work to identify and charge a second suspect, and believe it is only a matter of time before this occurs. I am confident it is only a matter of time before we are able to provide full closure for the family and the Canberra community, Mahler said. The $500,000 reward offer remains active, and information received can still be considered for this reward. Furthermore, investigators released an image of a man they believe may have information on what happened to Irma Polasics. On November 19, 1997, police were dispatched to Blissfield Township, Michigan, in response to the discovery of human remains in a cornfield owned and farmed by the caller. Blissfield Township is about 75 miles southwest of Detroit. The cornfield is located west of Cory Highway and north of Carroll Highway. There was a layer of snow covering most of the body. When police arrived to examine the remains, they observed the body of an unidentified, unclothed male that was missing the head and both hands. The hands appeared to have been cut from just above the wrist. Officers also observed what appeared to be saw striations on the ends of the bones. The body appeared to belong to a light-skinned Hispanic man. The man had no scars or tattoos. He was 5 foot 8 inches tall and weighed an estimated 150 pounds. Due to the removal of the head and hands, a positive ID never could be made by the Michigan State Police. A witness provided a possible name, Roberto. The witness said he was married with children and had a house where he raised chickens between McAllen and West Laco, Texas. When Roberto left home, he was supposed to be traveling only to Chicago and then back. Investigators were unable to find a Roberto that went missing that fit the description of the victim. On November 8, 2016, the National Missing and Identified Persons System released a sketch of Roberto based on what the witness told investigators, but no one came forward to identify the man. Finally, on January 24, 2023, 51-year-old Ricardo Sepulveda and 49-year-old Michael Sepulveda were arrested by U.S. Marshals in Ohio. They are brothers. Both of them were charged with taking the life of the unknown man. They were also charged with assault to maim, conspiracy to commit assault with intent to maim, tampering with evidence, and conspiracy to commit tampering with evidence. If convicted, Ricardo Sepulveda and Michael Sepulveda are facing a life sentence without the possibility of parole. A motive was not revealed and authorities did not say how the suspects were connected to the crime. Michigan attorney Dana Nessel was the one that announced the arrests. All crime victims deserve justice, regardless of how long it takes to receive it, said Nessel. I appreciate the hard work of the Michigan State Police, the many local and federal law enforcement agencies, and my criminal trial prosecutors for their persistence in pursuing this case. Unfortunately, 
Officials said the John Doe's identity is still unknown, but is believed to be a 32-year-old from Corpus Christi, Texas. Police said there is potential for additional charges against others who assisted in the actual crime or with covering it up. Anyone with information is asked to call Detective Sergeant Larry Rothman at 313-407-9379. 34-year-old Leonard James Irving lived in Portland, Oregon in 2011. His family and friends referred to him as LJ. He had three children aged five, six, and seven. On June 25, 2011, LJ, dressed in a lime green shirt and dark jeans, went out to celebrate his nephew's 21st birthday. He had gotten off work at 9.30 p.m. from his produce job at Winco Foods and had to report to his part-time chef's job at the Lloyd Center's Courtyard Marriott by 7 the next morning but he told his girlfriend he had to join his nephew at Season Inn's Sports Bar and Lounge on Northeast 82nd Avenue because family was important. Outside the bar after midnight, his nephew Lamar Lovett Hill and another man exchanged angry words and LJ stepped in to calm the situation. LJ then walked across the street with his nephew to his minivan in the lot of the New Happy Fortune Chinese restaurant. But before they could get in and leave, someone fatally shot LJ four times in the back and shot Lamar in the neck, wounding him. Samuel Thompson, who owned the Season Inn restaurant, said he did not hear the gunfire because he was in the rear lounge, where Benson High School alumni were celebrating their 10th reunion. But Thompson knew something was terribly wrong about 12.30 a.m. when people rushed into his business. Thompson ran across the street and found LJ on his back, his right arm on his chest, beside his van, the driver's door open. Thompson checked to see whether he was breathing and dialed 911 at 12.37 a.m. I sat down on the ground next to him. I had my hand on his arm, Thompson said. LJ's aunt heard that he had possibly been shot and drove to his mother, Lucy Mashu's house, and they drove to the crime scene together. It was there that Lucy learned LJ was not alive anymore. My son was an innocent bystander, she said. Some coward shot him. LJ's girlfriend, Adrian Milam said she thought it was a bad dream at first. She got word while at home where she was caring for LJ's three young children and her own four-year-old daughter. I kind of cried to myself in the pillow, Adrian said. Why do people do this? Why is it so easy for people to get guns? It is still surreal. I am thinking he could still be at work. Maybe he is not really gone. It's crazy how he can be there one day and not the next. They did not see the guy coming. It really hurts that it was cold-blooded for no reason. LJ grew up in Portland, but spent time during his high school years in Seattle with his dad. Family described him as a dedicated father who saw his children on his days off and weekends and dreamed of working full-time as a chef. His specialties, spicy foods, prime rib on Christmas, and jambalaya. In 2005, LJ was sentenced in federal court to 60 months in prison for distributing illegal substances and had been on federal supervision since June 2009. I thought my heart was broken that time his sister said. But she was proud that LJ took responsibility for his actions and served his time without blaming others. His family said he matured, got his GED, and since his release had worked hard to make ends meet for his children, holding down two jobs. 
investigators had few leads to work on, and the case unfortunately went cold not long after the investigation started. Then, in January 2023, 37-year-old Jawan Marcian Polk was arrested in connection with what happened to L.J. Irving. Polk had been living in Multnomah County Jail since May 2022 for another case in which he faces similar charges. He has pled not guilty in that case. Portland Police Bureau Chief Chuck Lovell said he was thrilled with the news of the arrest. I spoke to LJ's mother today, and she passed along her appreciation for the work of the detectives, Lovell said in a statement. I agree. This arrest is the culmination of almost 12 years of diligent, meticulous work by investigators, and I am grateful to them for their tireless efforts to achieve justice for LJ. A trial date has not yet been made public. Samuel Johnson, who was one of the first people at the crime scene, formerly worked at Self Enhancement Inc., a nonprofit organization that works with at risk youth. He left SEI to start his own business, but he launched Reclaim the Village a personal effort to spur the community to get involved to combat such violence after Andre Payton, a 19-year-old on his SEI caseload, was fatally shot in Old Town, a case that remains unsolved. Portland needs to wake up, Thompson said. At the end of the day, it has to be a call to action. The community needs to start preaching love once again. Too many lives have been taken for nonsense. It needs to be understood. A good man in LJ lost his life. 28-year-old Terry Ladwig lived in Concord, California in 1994. She was married to Navy Petty Officer Stephen Ladwig. On December 2, 1994, Terry was beaten and strangled in the apartment she shared with her husband on Adelaide Street in Concord. Stephen Ladwig found Terry's body after returning from a tour of duty above the USS Parch submarine. Stephen Ladwig was never a suspect in her demise. No suspects were named by police at the time. Forensic evidence was taken from the apartment. The only other lead investigators had was that there was no sign of forced entry. This possibly meant that Terry knew her attacker. Investigators were unable to identify a suspect, and the case went cold. On January 27, 2023, 55-year-old James Grimsley was arrested in Salt Lake City, Utah, and charged with taking Terry Ledwig's life. Originally from Oregon, Grimsley was employed as a trucker in Salt Lake City at the time of his arrest. We are not certain of the motive, Concord Police Lieutenant Sean Donnelly said. There was no sign of forced entry and we can presume that the victim let him into the apartment. I can tell you it was a violent scene. Looked like there was a violent struggle between Terry and the suspect. There was forensic evidence obtained from the scene along with many interviews conducted at the time of the initial investigation, Donnelly said. However, at this point we are not going to state the exact connection. That information may come from the district attorney's office or us after the arraignment. Grimsley was booked into jail in Salt Lake County on a $1 million warrant and was subsequently extradited to Contra Costa County. One of Terry's friends, Brittany Shores, had this to say after news of the arrest was made public. She was a great woman. She had a great personality. She made people laugh. She would brighten my day when she came in. Six-year-old Lubicha Tobich lived in Windsor, Ontario, Canada in 1971 with her parents and her eight-year-old brother, Michael. 
On the evening of May 14, 1971, Lubitsch and Michael were playing outside their Julod Road home. A man approached them just before 9 p.m. He offered Lubitsch $8 to take a walk with him down the street, which she accepted. The man also offered Michael money to go ride his bike in order to distract him while he walked away hand-in-hand hand with Lubitsch. Michael alerted his mother when the man and Lubitsch did not return and the police were called. Four hours later, Lubitsch's body was found less than a mile from her house in the backyard of a Hickory Avenue home. It was around 1 a.m. that an officer scanning yards with a flashlight found her body. The perpetrator left her body close to a gate leading to the back alley. Police found two of Lubitsch's teeth along with an adult tooth next to her body. She had been severely and violently beaten. The adult tooth and other evidentiary items were collected by investigators so that it could be used later on. Witnesses came forward saying they saw a strange man hanging out at a restaurant across the street from the Topic House. He was never located. The case attracted national attention. Hundreds of tips came in from across Canada and the U.S. At one point, there were more than 500 persons of interest in the case. In the 1990s, investigators were able to extract DNA from items found at the crime scene. In 2015, investigators announced that they were able to create a DNA profile of the perpetrator. Investigators sought the services of Parabon Nanolabs, a DNA technology company in Virginia that specializes in DNA phenotyping, the process of predicting physical appearance and ancestry from unidentified DNA evidence. Law enforcement agencies use the company's Snapshot DNA Phenotyping Service for narrowing suspect lists and generating leads in criminal investigations. Parabon came up with two different images. The one showed what the suspect looked like at 25 years old when the crime was committed. The other image showed what the suspect may look like now at approximately 70 years old. In December 2019, Windsor Police Staff Sergeant Scott Chapman announced that Lubitsch Tobich's case was finally solved. Chapman said that Lubitsch's case is among several cold cases that were solved using genetic genealogy. Our case was one of the very first Canadian cases that used the technique to identify an offender, Chapman said. On Ancestry research websites such as GED Match and Family Tree DNA, Users have the option to not share their genetic information with law enforcement, Chapman said. Police were ultimately able to identify the perpetrator through the DNA of a distant cousin that was found in a database. Parabon Nanolabs assisted with the identification. Windsor Police made the decision at the time not to reveal the unknown man's name. They only said that he recently passed away and settled out west after committing the crime. While police were applauded for finally solving the crime, the refusal to release the man's name was met with some public criticism. Finally, in 2023, Windsor police changed their stance. It was announced that Frank Arthur Hall was the man responsible. He was 22 years old back in 1971. Hall lived less than two miles from the Topich family. He was never a suspect or a person of interest until the DNA match confirmed his guilt. Hall passed away in February 2019 in Edmonton, Canada, just a few months before the DNA match. Windsor Police Staff Sergeant Scott Chapman was the one who announced that Hall was the one responsible. He explained that in 2019, when he announced the case was solved, 
that was unclear whether they could legally name Hall since there was such little precedent. That was part of the reason Hall's name was withheld at that time, said Chapman, acknowledging the landscape has since changed as genetic genealogy has become more mainstream. Prior to the release of that information, Chapman flew to Edmonton to tell Hall's family members. They were shocked but showed strength, he said. We have to keep in mind whatever Frank Hall did in his life is not a reflection on these people, Chapman said. They've been victimized by this information too. According to Chapman, police records are unclear as to whether Hall's home was canvassed as part of the initial investigation back in 1971. Hall was, however, known to police in Windsor and in other places, mostly for property crimes like theft. Though his name was not known to the public, other law enforcement agencies have been made aware of Hall since 2019. Now that Hall's name is out there, Chapman believes it could lead to more tips from the public regarding other cases. It will give potentially new life to different investigations, he said. It is entirely possible.